All right, folks, this is chapter 13, all about mineral and rock resources. It's a fairly short chapter, so I think I'll finish it all in one video pretty easily here. Um, first of all, some definitions here. A mineral resource, definition of a mineral resource, is any rock, mineral, or element that has some useful property to us as humans. Uh, for metals, this includes iron, copper, aluminum, lead, zinc, gold, just for some examples. Uh, Non-metals include stone, sand, gravel, limestone, salt, phosphates, clays, all that good stuff. And here's a nice chunk of galena, our ore of lead or one of our primary ores of lead. Uh, a couple more definitions, uh, but first of all, again, just to remind you, here's our, our eight uh, friends, right? Our, our eight most common elements in Earth's crust, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, right? These are all um, the, the, the most common elements, and so most of our uh, minerals on the planet are made of these, right? And the rest of the uh, elements on Earth are, are essentially rare, but certain geological processes can help to concentrate these rare elements. And by concentrate, I mean, you know, there's gold, there's silver, there's, you know, this everywhere. But, uh, you know, it's not economical just to go out and mine your backyard for this stuff, right? We need to figure out uh, what geological processes concentrate these different elements and how we can uh, extract them. Uh, and of course, you know, how concentrated these elements are is a big consideration uh, in, in mining. Uh, you know, you got to be able to make money. If you're losing money mining, uh, nobody's going to go in and, and mine it, right? And this leads to the idea of an enrichment factor. Enrichment factor is just how much a mineral resource in a particular deposit is enriched or concentrated above the aver average concentration in the crust. So how much above just the background, you know, uh, noise is it concentrated in this deposit or minerals uh, or minerals are minerals that contain an element or compound with economic value it may be the mineral itself or it may be an element that we're after within that mineral right and or deposit on the other hand is the rock or sediment containing the ore mineral in those economical concentrations right not just anywhere but in concentrations that are economical uh, high grade ore is, is something that has a high enrichment level or high enrichment factor, right? And then low grade ore uh, is something that has a low enrichment level, but is still enriched above uh, just the background, uh, you know, normal crustal average. Uh, a couple other definitions here. Mineral reserves, these are any minerals that are uh, economical to mine under our current conditions. So a deposit that is economical, in other words, we will make money uh, uh, mining this or extracting this substance. Uh, this is a mineral reserve. And that is uh, opposed to uh, a mineral resource, which is just any deposit that is feasible to mine with our current technology, uh, whether or not we actually make any money at it. So this is all of our um, mineral resources here, right? Everything that is uh, mineable, right? But the stuff that is is actually that will make money that's economic to mine is known as mineral reserves. This, of course, can change depending on supply and demand. And for an example, right now, gas prices are super low. Uh, price per barrel for crude oil is down at like twenty something dollars, uh, ridiculously low. Um, uh, during this uh, um, uh, pandemic, right? So that means that, you know, some of these less economical, less enriched areas, right? It's going to be harder to extract, more costly to extract, and it's not, you know, currently feasible. So this mineral reserves has shrunk as, as in relation to our, our oil and stuff right now. Now we can still, you know, have access to everything that, you uh, that uh, uh, we can, you know, so we could, you know, say mine this deposit, even if we're losing a million dollars a ton on it, we could mine it. That is, that is a mineral resource. Again, no statement on whether or not it is economical to mine. Let's talk a little bit about some different uh, types of mineral deposits that we have, some different sources uh, for our, our economic minerals. I'm going to start with diamonds. Uh, diamond pipes, also known as 
kimberlite pipes. Now these form uh, fairly deep in the earth, 75 to 125 miles down. So we're talking, you know, down in the mantle itself, right? Uh, this is called the diamond window, our upper mantle. This is where diamonds form. Above that we have coal, right? Oil, natural gas, but all of that, you know, graphite and then eventually pressed down into diamond under intense you know metamorphic conditions uh what a uh, what a uh, kimberlite pipe is basically highly pressured rapid decompressing magma uh that creates a small volcanic eruption and a carrot shaped crater as you can see here almost a carrot shaped crater very very deep carrot shaped crater right this is filled with magnesium rich volcanic rocks what do you mean by that i mean it's mafic right iron and magnesium rich those are our mafic rocks uh and they're also also going to be you know as this this is a little you know small but explosive volcanic eruption you know diamonds were first actually found in the sediments around these kimberlite pipes, you know, as the ejecta from these little explosions, and then eventually they're traced back. And these are what we're now mining, especially in South Africa and stuff with the, uh, the kimberlite pipes. Another type of uh, uh, igneous deposit is an intrusive deposit. Uh, and these are generally mined in, in what we call large intrusive igneous bodies, big ones. This is, I believe, the Stillwater Complex up in Montana, huge one there, right? Uh, so as we know from uh, earlier in the semester, as magma as starts to cool, right, and it starts to cool down, crystals start to form, right? As these crystals form, at different temperatures, right? So first we form those isolated tetrahedra, right? And often these are going to be actually less dense than a lot of that mafic magma. They can rise to the surface, right? Um, but uh, they can, uh, uh, in our early phases, of course, we have crystals and magma still in the deposits, right? And this leads to the idea of crystal settling. Uh, early form minerals can settle to the bottom of the magma chamber or the top of the magma chamber. They'll separate out by density, right? And creates what's called a layered intrusion. A lot of stuff we find in these layered intrusions are chromium, titanium, vanadium, right? And here what we have are these layers of, uh, in this case, chromite, which is our one of our main ores for chromium. Uh, and those, you know, the crystals were settling by density out into these different layers here, right? So this is crystal settling. We also have intrusive igneous deposits in the form of dikes, sills, and pegmatites, and that's what we're looking at here. And basically what these are, these form later in the cooling process. This is the pressurized residual mag magma that's been forced into uh, fractures and cracks. And what do I mean by residual magma? Well, of course, most of our uh earth rock forming minerals are made out of those those you know eight common elements but everything else that doesn't fit into those chemical structures such as lithium beryllium niobium tantalum right these uh end up staying in a liquid and they get basically concentrated right everything that's rare starts to get concentrated as the the normal minerals crystallize out in this residual magma this is then pressurized and forced into cracks where it cools and then becomes enriched right because this this residual magma is already enriched uh in these rare earth elements right and uh so in these pegmatites we can find which of course pegmatite is an especially coarse grain silica rich rock that uh you see huge crystals in there and that's due to the presence of water as well uh very similar in composition to granite but you'll have those rare earth elements crystallizing out of that residual magma in these cracks and fissures that we call pegmatites or dikes. Another type of igneous resource we have is a hydrothermal deposit, hydro water thermal temperature, so superheated water basically. So water around magma bodies, right, is going to become superheated as under pressure in the earth, right? As it becomes heated, it reacts with um, rocks around it, right, and picks up elements and ions out of these these rocks and transports them to new areas uh, around this uh, this uh, um, uh, magmatic intrusion. So as these the water circulates through here, comes close to contact, right, heats up, rises, right, cools, falls, right. Uh, as it does the cycle, it takes elements and pushes them up into new areas, right, and we can get mineralization uh, occurring uh, in cracks and fractures um, in, in these uh, 
these uh, magmatic zones. Uh, a lot of these minerals are, are very sulfur rich. Sulfur is a very highly mobile element. Uh, mobility again means it, it travels easily in water. So a lot of our, our hydrothermal deposits are, are actually sulfide deposits rich in sulfur. Uh, things that we get out of these, copper, lead, zinc, silver, and gold. Uh, this is one of the primary ways we get gold. So if you're hard rock mining, right, uh, what you're mining are these old, these old veins of, of, uh, of um, uh, hydrothermal veins that the gold has concentrated in. Another way that we can uh, uh, extract resources from former igneous deposits are, are um, oh, whoops, what's going on here? Oh, sorry, that's the same as the last one. But uh, what we have here is are called massive sulfide deposits. What you see here is a black smoker. These were discovered back in the 70s or so. They exist along our mid-ocean ridges. And basically, this is just, you know, superheated water that's being pushed through the ground at these divergent margins, right? And what you see here is just a cloud of just sulfur-rich uh, uh, material coming out and as these form right they they make these massive massive deposits of sulfide which we call massive sulfide deposits and these are the remnants of ancient spreading centers and black smokers so wherever you find massive sulfide deposits you had at least a former you know um, uh, spreading center and we have this here in Michigan as well along the Keweenaw Peninsula in the UP, where we have our, our copper mines, right? That is, again, one of these massive sulfide deposits uh, from an ancient spreading center about 1.1 billion years ago, uh, known as the Mid-Continental Rift. It tried to rip our continent in half, but, you know, plate dynamics changed and it was no longer needed. But what we have left there are these massive sulfides. Right, and there's an issue with sulfide because sulfur is highly mobile. This stuff can uh, uh, weather very easily and produce all sorts of environmental damage, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes here. Metamorphic resources. What kind of metamorphic resources do we have? Well, from regional metamorphism, we get slate, we get marble, and we get asbestos. From contact metamorphism, we get anything that has to do with kind of those, those hydrothermal fluids, right? Alteration zones around the magma body itself. And then, of course, vein deposits, uh, hydrothermal vein deposits. From sedimentary rocks, we actually derive quite a few resources as well. Sand, gravel, and clay. This is a, the number one most widely used mineral resource in the world. Right? We use this for paving, for road base, for building, for construction, all sorts of stuff. Right, So sand, gravel, and clay, the most widely used resource in the world. Uh, for example, quartz sand is readily made into glass. Gravel, sand, you know, construction, landscaping, uh, materials, right? Clays we use for pottery and bricks, right? So all of these are our resources that we extract from sedimentary deposits. Another type of deposit that we extract resources from is called a placer deposit. And a placer deposit are stream deposits or sometimes beach deposits. Now, if you like watching Gold Rush or Bering Sea Gold or any of those, right, those, those folks are mining ancient stream deposits, ancient placer deposits, right? And the interesting thing about ancient streams, ancient placers, you know, uh, streams, right, uh, Sedimentation is all about energy, so certain areas of stream beds can, can you know, certain uh, tend to concentrate uh, denser minerals such as as gold and, and the like, right? So you can get also obviously gold from this, platinum, tin, titanium, and gemstones. You can get all sorts of uh, uh, different things from these placer deposits. There are also what we call residual weathering deposits, and these are basically secondary minerals. So minerals that form secondarily uh, as uh, uh, in the ground, as as you know, in cracks and vugs and voids, right? Uh, so minerals break down uh, the the fluids uh, in the ground, right? Transport these elements and then redeposit them in different pockets, right? Uh, in different, for example, you know, bauxite, we talked about that when we talked soils, right? Bauxite, it's our, it's our ore for aluminum. That is concentrated because aluminum is a um, um, uh, immobile element. It does not 
rust, it's not chemically active, uh, and it becomes concentrated in the soil, right? Uh, and a lot of these are, are uh, found around the oxidizer reduced zones in the ore deposits, uh, which is just above you get an oxidation, just below you get reduction uh, in a water table and you can form all sorts of different coal minerals. This is my favorite mineral in the world here. This is wolfenite, which is a lead molybdate. We mine it for not only lead, but also molybdenum. Uh, and iron, copper, lead, zinc, right? All of these we mine and plus a few others, right? Some other sedimentary resources that we have, especially here in Michigan, banded iron formation. This stuff formed a long time ago, 2.6 to 1.8 billion years ago. And this was formed by algae as it breathed. And this is what we're seeing here. The red you see is chert. The black, uh, the darker colors here are I, uh, hematite and magnetite, which are iron oxide minerals, um, which is a uh, iron attached with an oxygen. Um, and the way they formed was uh, early on the earth, when we have single back cell bacteria and algae, uh, there was no free oxygen on the planet. It was all tied up in stuff like, like water, right? But there was lots of free iron, and iron is a very mobile element, but more, even more than being like liking being in water, it loves oxygen. So if it finds an oxygen, it's gonna form an iron oxide mineral. So what's the byproduct of photosynthesis? Well, oxygen, right? So these little algae are breathing, and when they breathe out, they release oxygen. The iron in the ocean finds that oxygen and falls out as an iron oxide mineral. Whoops. So this is what you see is here is, is the remains of these ancient organisms breathing, essentially. Yeah. Some other major uh, uh, minerals that we have here in uh, Michigan, salt and gypsum. Now, gypsum is very important for us around here in Grand Rapids. They're no longer active, but they're underground gypsum mines here, and that was a big part of uh, early industry right here in, in Grand Rapids. And gypsum is used for for plaster, for drywall, right? Gypsum board is drywall, um, and as a reagent for something. And then salt, of course, you know, not just table salt, but road salt, and salt is a, a common reagent that you need for, for many industrial chemicals, right? We can also get boron from this. But salt uh, is on the other side of our state, underneath Lake Huron, uh, is one of the world, is actually the world's largest uh, salt mine, uh, about a mile deep underneath uh, Lake Huron uh, extends out uh, about seven and a half kilometers underneath the lake, I believe. But this is a picture of one of these huge salt mines here. Here's the that, that Detroit salt mine, that largest salt mine in the world, is actually on the other side of the lake. It's uh, from Ontario. But uh, you can see here's a massive two-lane highway uh, down there for these massive, massive vehicles. This is huge. This is what's called... Um, um, uh, pillar and room, room and pillar. So you leave these big setups here. These you don't mine these. These are these pillars are left basically to hold up the ceiling of the mine itself. So you mine in between there, but you leave these as support themselves. So this is a, one of the largest salt mines uh, in the world. Another resource that we uh, we mine from uh, sedimentary rocks is limestone. We use this for lime, for aggregates, so for for aggregate, for cement, and for building. Uh, you know, with itself, you know, pyramids are built out of limestone, right? So this has been used for you know thousands of years. And one of the reasons is limestone is made out of calcite. Calcite is a hardness of three on the most hardness scale, so it's very soft and easy to to cut and work with, All right? Now, we also have the world's largest uh, limestone quarry right here in Michigan as well, Rogers City, Michigan, which is uh, uh, on the other side of the state, up north a little bit. All right, so here's what we have. It's called the calcite quarry. Why? Because limestone is made out of calcite, right? Here's the whole city of Rogers City, and you see that this calcite quarry is actually larger than the city itself. And here's looking down at, and this is, a massive, massive crane. This is a huge crane, just to give you an idea of the scale and the size of this thing. But it's also very important for us here uh, in Michigan that this is right up against the lake, and that's very nice because uh, it makes shipping a lot easier. It's cheaper to ship stuff, uh, you know, over a lake than, than, than anyway over over land. So this helps keep our our limestone industry active and viable here in Michigan. 
some different types of mining techniques that are used. First we have open pit mines for surface mining. This is uh, something you're going after with a large volume of very low grade ores. And here you have to mine in what's known as a kind of a stair step or, or terraced fashion for a few reasons. You don't want the, you know, the sides collapsing and caving in on you. And also somehow you have to get your vehicles in and out of there, right? Uh, but in order to go deeper then, if you want to go deeper after more and more of this, this, you know, this low grade ore, you also have to build it wider and wider and wider in order to not collapse the, the structure on you, right? This here, folks, is a picture of the largest hole humans have ever, ever dug. This is the Brigham Canyon Copper Mine in Utah. Uh, it is two and a half miles wide and 3,000 feet deep. And what they're mining here is, is copper, of course. And, and it's a, this is, again, a massive sulfide deposit, probably part of that uh, mid-continental rift as well. I'm not entirely sure about that. But these are massive sulfides, right? And uh, so they're, they're, you know, not a lot of copper in there. But then the ore is low grade. But mining it like this, you still, you know, it's, it's, it's got enough of enrichment that you're making money still mining this. And this is the, the biggest hole humans have ever done. So surface mining, you mine, uh, you know, uh, low grade ore, but strip mining, this is looking at generally following a, 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 a sedimentary deposit and often coal uh, and that would, you know, sedimentary deposits are laid down horizontal. So they, they run parallel to the surface, right? You don't have to dig down. Uh, so you're after like, you know, one seam of coal or something like that, right? And that seam of coal will run, you know, horizontally across the surface of the land. Uh, so uh, you scrape off the overburden, right? Uh, and then you get down to the coal layer and then you mine the coal layer. But because the coal layer is horizontal, if you want to mine more, you have to mine out horizontally, right? And this uh, has been taken kind of to an extreme in the example here. This is mountaintop removal, and a lot of the Appalachian coal deposits are after this. And you can see kind of at, at this layer here must have been the coal that they were after. In order to get that, right, they basically, yeah, remove the mountaintop, blast the entire top of the mountain away to get at this, you know, one or two little coal seams here. Right now, if they want to mine more, they're going to have to blast more mountain away, right? This is a very environmentally damaging uh, uh, process. Underground mining techniques, uh, uh, you know, this is after generally, you know, deeply buried uh, ore deposits, and you're going to go down after highly concentrated veins or, or, or uh, you know, highly uh, con uh, enriched uh, areas, right? Some of the gold mines in South Africa go down 13,000 feet below the surface chasing these gold veins. Uh, another type of mining is placer mining, right? And because it can be done via, via dredging uh, or hydraulic mining, and that's what you see here, uh, and that's what's done a lot in the California Gold Rush, right? So this is an old placer deposit, and what they're doing is washing, just basically taking these, these high power hoses and washing all the sediment down through these sluice boxes where they're catching the gold, right? Now, modern days, if you're watching like, you know, Gold Rush or whatever, that's, they're doing this, this placer mining, but they're basically, you know, removing the overbird and getting down to the good placer, uh, and then, uh, mining that out, um, via, um, um, uh, machines, right? So they'll take it, they'll dump it in, and then sort it with water. So it's all hydraulic sorting again. Right? But once you get this material right out of the ground, now you need to extract the element or, or the mineral or whatever you're looking for. And there's a couple different ways to do that. One is smelting. And this is you heat the thing up until the chemical bonds are broken. Then you chemically separate and extract like the, say, the gold or something like that, right? Um, but another one that is used quite often is, is leaching. And basically what you do is you take a pit, uh, you take the, uh, the ore, you crush it up fine, put it in this pit, and then just spray the whole thing with cyanide. Yes, cyanide, right? Um, and that cyanide is going to leach out the elements that you're interested in. But can you see any potential issues with giant pits of cyanide just hanging out, right? I think I can think of a few few environmental issues that that might cause, right? Um, distribution supply is, of course, close related to the rock cycle and tectonic activity, not, 
you know, we're, I mean, it's not evenly distributed among different countries. So there are what we know as strategic minerals, and these are minerals that a country needs but must be imported. They don't have them or they don't have enough of them. Here in the United States, our strategic minerals, the minerals we need but don't have enough of, are chromium, cobalt, manganese, and platinum. So a couple notes about uh, environment and mitigation of, uh, you know, these, these things related to mining, right? Um, so pretty much in any scenario, they're, you know, as far as mining, as far as, you know, dumping stuff on the ground for, you know, Wolverine Worldwide or whatever. I mean, there have been no... Uh, essentially non-existent until the 1970s, till the Clean Air Act of 1970, Clean Water Act of 1972, and we were a big part of actually around the Great Lakes here uh, enacting these, uh, these, uh, um, these two bills because uh, here in the Great Lakes our idea was, well, you know, we've got a lot of water here, we'll just pump all of our industrial stuff into the water and it will just take it, right? But then we started doing things like Oh, catching rivers on fire. Yes, rivers on fire. So uh, we decided, ooh, maybe that's not so good. So we got this Clean Air and Clean Water Act. All right now we have more environmental controls on and regulations on uh, on mining. But before that was really nothing. You could take the mercury, dump it anywhere. Take the sulfur piles, dump them anywhere. Right. Uh, and a couple of issues that we have around mines, especially large open pit mines, right, are heavy metals and acid mine drainage. Right? So the tailings, the leftovers, the spoils of the metallic ore, right? Like say, after the copper or something, right? So they pull out the copper from the copper sulfides, but they're not really interested in the sulfur or, you know, the, the lead sulfides or the, the iron sulfides. They're just really after the copper, right? So all the rest of this gets left behind. Sulfides are easily weathered on the surface of the earth. And when they weather, they release these heavy toxic metals into the water, into the groundwater, and they also release sulfide ions, which combine with water in the ground or in the air to form sulfuric acid. So we get sulfuric acid mine drainage, we get possibly sulfuric acid in the groundwater, sulfuric acid rain. And the picture here that I'm showing you is the tailings pile from the world's largest hole that man has ever done, that Brigham Canyon copper mine. And just to put this into perspective here, right, can't even see the top. Here are telephone poles, right? Here is a very large industrial warehouse. You can see just the size of this. I mean, all that, you know, 3,000 feet deep by two and a half miles wide, right? That had to go somewhere, and here it is, right? And imagine all the sulfides just draining and leaching off of that, right? Uh, as far as ore processing, right, that cyanide heap leaching, that can cause danger, right? Uh, danger that, you know, maybe the, the liners, you know, leak and it gets into the, the public water supply or leaks into the environment somewhere else. Uh, and also mercury can be a very, very large uh, uh, issue. Mercury um, uh, is used uh, in gold recovery because for some reason mercury has this crazy affinity for gold and it kind of takes gold and clumps it together. So this was used often by miners, right? And you need virgin mercury to do this. You take the mercury, you swirl it around for every ounce of gold, you need an ounce of mercury basically, right? And uh, um, uh, and then you, 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 you take it, you use it, and you basically throw the, the mercury away or burn it off. And that's, you know, mercury is extremely toxic, especially in vapor form. And it's what's known as a, a bioaccumulative agent. It concentrates itself up the food chain. So often some top predator fish, like the kind we eat, right, uh, can have, you know, millions or tens of millions of times the level of mercury that, that uh, you know, the water they're living in, which is why it's dangerous for pregnant women especially to eat uh, wild caught salmon and such, right? And between 1860 and 1900, about three or eight million, between three and eight million pounds of mercury uh, entered rivers in California just in those 40 years during that gold rush. And it's a big issue right now down in the Amazon with illegal gold mining going on down there. Also smelting, you know, heating things up. This releases sulfide into the air, uh, causes acid rain, causes heavy metal fallout, right? Uh, and then 
uh, maybe not such a uh, uh, an issue, but collapse and subsidence. Old underground mines can collapse, causing the ground above them to subside. I remember uh, as a kid out in Colorado, there was a a um, because the front range of Colorado is riddled with all old underground coal mines. Uh, somebody was building a new sub development, and they showed up to work one day, and half of their houses were gone. Well. They didn't check their geology. They were building on top of an old coal mine and adding that extra weight of these new houses caused it to collapse and subside. Right? Um, another issue is abandoned mine hazards, right? Old mines, uh, quarries, these, these can be, you know, um, you know, dangerous to, to, to adventure into and hang out in and play in, but I'll tell you, man, are they, are they fun, right? Uh, here's just a little video for you to watch on, um, just a short one on uh, the illegal gold mining out in, uh, um, uh, down in uh, Brazil and South America. Um, let's check that out uh, real quick and, and, and uh, um, get an idea of, of, you know, kind of how it, it harms uh, the environment and everything, right? All right, folks, we will see you next time. Enjoy your weekend.